All right, let's get started, everybody. Welcome to day seven of Organometallics. Hope everyone had a good weekend. Um, uh, there should have been, uh, you should have, on your way in, picked up a problem set. Um, and this will be due in one week, or on, on Friday, sorry, or on, on next Monday. One week. Okay, sorry. And then we won't take, we're going to try to get it back in two days, so we cannot take any late problems. So it will be due one week from today. Um, you'll, as you, I'd recommend skimming through um, quickly today to sort of see what problems are, are going to be more tricky, and, and then um, you know, group group work discussion are, are very much encouraged. Um, and so take a look through it today. Um, try, try to anticipate any that, that might be tricky, um, and then they'll be due um, a week from today on Monday. Um, and then we'll return them ASAP so that you can have a chance to look through them in preparation for the midterm. So the idea is that this will, you know, your average problem on the problem set is going to be a little bit harder than your average problem on the midterm. So the idea is to, to push you a little bit. And there are even some, um, as you read through the problem set, you'll, you'll notice there are some topics that we didn't um, explicitly cover in much detail in class, and the problem set is really designed to um, push you to, to learn about um, something that's based on principles we've covered in class, but maybe is a little bit um, a little bit new. Okay, are there any questions on the problem set? And there's one other piece of um, bookkeeping that, that is important, um, which is that the midterm exam um, will be rather than the Wednesday like it's listed on the schedule will be held two days later on the Friday, and that's to avoid conflict with the heterocycles midterm. And so the... Is, is, you know, it's just a class that we're moving. The class. Yeah, midterm will be the same thing, but there's a class that is during their midterm. Oh, I see. Okay. The heterocycles midterm is the... I misspoke. Sorry about that. What is it? Okay, so 29. So yeah, we're not having class on 29. We're having class on 26, and your exam is still May 1st. Okay, we'll send out an email with more uh, information about this. Um, good. Any any questions right now? Okay, so today um, we're going to cover um, what is a fun topic um, in organometallic chemistry, which is the um, chemistry of, of organometallic complexes that contain um, multiple bonds to the carbon or heteroatom uh, fragment of interest. Um, and these are really typified by carbene complexes. Um, and, and this is, a, I, I think, interesting area of, of study because it challenges some of the um, formalisms that we learn about oxidation state, electron counting, etc., and because uh, obviously the reactivity of, of these sorts of complexes is, is, is quite unique and has really profound implications for um, organic synthesis. So first, um, let's just start out with a general discussion of the properties of um, carbenes um, and, and then move into discussion about um, properties of carbenes and complexation to um, metals. And so um, the, the first thing to note, and probably this would be review for um, everyone here, is that um, carbenes can exist in two flavors um, depending on their electronic configuration, either a singlet carbene or a triplet carbene. Um, and so carbene has um, an uh, sp2 hybridized uh, bonding orbital, typically uh, bonding with two, um, two, two carbon fragments, and then a um, sp2 uh, lobe that can be doubly occupied in the singlet state or singly occupied in the triplet state, um, and then a, 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 an open p orbital um, that, can, that is um, unoccupied in the singlet state and singly occupied in the triplet state. And so in each of these different electronic configurations, the carbene can, can um, bond to the metal, and, and that has different um, implications in terms of the electronic configuration at the metal. 
And one of the differences um, at, at a very high level uh, of, of between carbenes and other ligands that we've studied so far in class is that carbenes are rarely stable in their free state. And so when you're talking about um, some of the ligand substitution reactions that we learned of ligands like CO uh, or uh, alkoxides or, 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 or fluorides, this is not, this is not so relevant with carbenes. The chemistry involved is, is just fundamentally different. And, and one of the things that might not be obvious um, um, but, but it, it's interesting to note is that metal carbene chemistry is, is somewhat new. Um, the, the reports of the first metal carbene date back to the um, 1960s, 1970s, so it's relatively a, a young field. And I think this is consistent with sort of this, this uh, renaissance, this wave of interest in the uh, 50s and 60s that really propelled organometallic chemistry to the, the forefront. And so let's uh, now go over uh, general categories of metal carbene complexes. Um, and this is using, uh, for those who are keeping up with the reading, this is using the organizational structure outlined in the, the Hartwig textbook. Um, and so there are many different flavors of metal carbenes. You could probably come up with more categories than this. You could come up with fewer. But these are the five that uh, are outlined in the Hartwig textbook. Um, and so we'll, we'll talk about each very briefly. And the important thing is that there are two um, electronic configurations um, that describe essentially all carbenes. Uh, one we'll call Fischer type, the other we'll call Schrock type. And so, so we'll talk about those in, in, in even more depth as we move forward. So, so here are five, five types um, of metal carbenes that you'll, you'll encounter um, in, in your reading of the literature. Um, the first is uh, so-called Fischer-type carbenes. Um, I think the, the bonding picture will become clearer here when, when we actually look at some specific examples. Uh, but these are cases where typically you have a um, heteroatom that contains lone pair electrons connected directly to the carbene atom. This is capable of donating electrons uh, to the open p orbital of the carbene. Um, the metals involved here are typically middle to late transition metals with strong um, uh, high ex uh, 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 accepting ligands. Um, and, and so the overall electronic configuration renders these types of carbenes electrophilic at the uh, carbene and nucleophilic at the metal. And so it's often stated that in terms of reactivity, if you see a Fischer carbene, you can think of the, met the carbon metal bond as being essentially like a carbonyl. And, and, and that, as a first pass approximation, will allow you to predict a lot of uh, reactivity of Fischer carbene. And, and another point here that we'll come back to is that um, Fischer carbenes are more common with um, low oxidation state or low valent um, metal complexes. The, the, essentially, the exact opposite situation is, is, is found encountered in Schrock type carbenes. So here, um, the R1 and R2 are typically, typically alkyl fragments or hydrogen atom. Um, the carbene carbon center is is um, it is, is now uh, nucleophilic in character, um, and, and and the metal is electrophilic in character. And so, I think one of the classical types of reactions that you can think about with with uh, Schrock-type carbenes is sort of like tebi type olefination, where if you react a Schrock-type carbene with an aldehyde or ketone, then you're going to transfer the alkylidine group, which will be this group, uh, to form a new CC double bond and make a metal oxo. And that is a direct, uh, directly stems from the fact that this, is new, this carbon is nucleophilic in character. These are going to be more commonly encountered when you're talking about high oxidation, say high valent metals. Um, that are typically going to be um, uh, early or late in the transition level series. Uh, metal, so, so there's another type of, um, of, of important um, complex that we'll, we'll discuss in a little more detail in one of the problems of the day today, but these are so-called carbonoid complexes. Um, and and I, we won't talk too much about those, these in today's class, but essentially one of the distinguishing features of carbonoid type chemistry, well, let me, let me uh, point out two distinguishing features. So one is that 
these um, reactions almost always involve some diazo compound or diazo equivalent, um, and that the reactivity that you observe really closely parallels what you'd expect from the free carbene. So, of course, free carbenes can do reactions like cyclopropanation of alkenes and, and CH activation. Indeed, that's the same type of reactivity that carbene, carbenoids um, can do. And so some, some of the signaling elements that you might be in a carbenoid regime are, are when the catalysts involved. I like these uh, bisrhodium um, tetracarboxylate pow uh, wheel type complexes. Um, or metal porphyrins, abbreviated here as, as N4 or, or por porphyrin like ligands, um, other tetradentate, um, ruthenium complex, copper complexes, etc. And, and in terms of electron counting, oxidation state, sort of the, the accounting business of, of, of describing uh, carbonoid complexes, um, you, you can treat them like uh, Fischer, Fischer carbenes, um, and, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, vinylidines are another um, 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 you know, rel relatively commonly encountered class of, of uh, metal carbene complexes. Typically, th these are going to be formed by react uh, interactions um, between uh, terminal alkynes and, and metals. And so if you first draw a pi bound um, or a, a alkyne uh, that is sigma uh, bonded to a metal complex, and then, and, and, and then invoke a tautomerization, and you can get to a vinylidine species. These are typically electrophilic at the vinylidine carbon atom. Um, and and um, this is most common for middle or late transition metals, and, and the bonding uh, picture here in terms of electron counting is similar to the Fisher, Fisher case. Um, and then in the past, I would say maybe 20 20 to 25 years, there's been a, a massive rise in uh, NHC type complexes. So, so we'll also talk about these. These are also a subset of, of sort of the Fisher Fisher type uh, Fisher end of the carbene spectrum. Um, and um, typically, the carbene here is going to be a spectator ligand in, in, in catalytic applications. So the rate of ligand exchange between metal NHC is, is extremely slow, and so these typically coordinate to the ligand and, and, and don't let go under most, uh, most conditions. Okay, any questions here? I think this will become more clear when we move to um, specific examples. So the carbonoids usually Which one? The uh, carbonoid carb one. They're, they're usually, well, I mean, classically, um, free carbenes are sort of have ambiphilic character, but are often described as being electrophilic, right? So for a reagent to so cyclopropanate an alkene, it, it does need to have an ambiphilic character. But, but normally, if you were to ask me to describe this, I would, des I would describe it as, as overall being highly electrophilic. And, and so the three that we'll spend the most time on uh, today are, are Fisher, Schrock, and then, and, then, uh, and then the NHC type. Okay, so Fisher type, um, these, these species are, are, um, are uh, overall electrophilic. Um, and, and, and classically, so we'll go through sort of the, the classical syntheses of, of these types of complexes in, in just a minute. Um, um, but, um, you know, you know so suffice to say that typically they, these result from, um, like, metal alkyl addition to, to um, species like chromium carbonyl complexes and then trapping uh, with an electrophilic R group here. I realize. So as I've drawn here in terms of partial charges, you have um, uh, nucleophilic. If you react this with an arbitrary nucleophile, it's typically going to, to engage the, the uh, carbon atom of the carbene, um, the, the metal in this case, electrophilic. 
um, and, and, and these sorts of species are found most commonly when the metal is electron rich, uh, very common for D6, 18 electron complexes. Um, and then in terms of just thinking about um, sort of how to describe The, the, the carbene is essentially coordinating uh, as a dative ligand, uh, and then the empty p orbital here is being stabilized by interaction, by, by uh, donation from the non bonding electrons on, on the alkoxide in this case. <clears throat> so you're, you're going to encounter. Um, um, these as uh, Fischer carbons, as we said, more commonly with late transition metals. Overall, the metal carbon bond is, is weak, so one of the ways in which you can probe that is by looking at the metal carbon bond distance, and that contrasts the Schrock type case. Um, metals typically in low oxidation state. And, and commonly, you'll see Fischer carbines having these CO ligands. That's in part due to the synthetic route to access them, and in part due to the fact that these. Um, high acceptor ligands stabilize the overall complex. And in terms of electron counting, the important thing here is that these are L-type or, or L1-type as, as drawn here. So it's essentially just a data interaction. And then in troc-type carbenes, essentially the, the, the opposite of everything I just told you is true. So these are nucleophilic at carbon. Um, and, and, and typically, the carbon, um, the, the reactivity of the overall complex is that these carbons uh, are highly reactive with various electrophiles. The metal center here is, is, is electrophilic in character, so nucleophiles can coordinate to it or attack it. Um, and then this is most common with electron deficient metal species, typically uh, D0, this looks like D6, D0 or D2. And, and 16 or 14 electron count uh, complexes. And, and so um, typically here, the groups off of the carbene are, are um, H atoms or alkyl groups. And so, so these are, um, anytime you have a group like this, where this is alkyl, this is called an alkylidine. And because when truck um, type carbenes were first prepared, um, the only versions that were known were alkylidines. Often in the old literature, people used truck type carbene and alkylidine um, interchangeably. But, but now I think people prefer more precise nomenclature because there are Fischer type alkylidines and truck type alkylidines. But often you'll see people just throwing around language alkylidine, and that, that, will, that, that, that sometimes refers typically to truck type carbene. So the alkylidines here would be expected to be destabilized if you have a heteroatom um, uh, group attached to them because that just pumps too much electron density into the into the, uh, uh, the uh, non-bond uh, empty p orbital, um, and then this is most common for early transition metals, um, as I said, D two D zero, um, stronger metal characterized by stronger carbon metal bonds, high oxidation state. Um, the other ligands on the metal are typically going to be strong sigma donors. Um, and then in terms of electron counting, these are treated as X2 type um, ligands. And so um, here you basically just treat, count each of these as a bond to an alkyl group. That's, that's kind of how I think of it. Are both what? Oh, um, yeah, that's a good question. So, um, in this case, so 
So the answer is um, that the the Fisher type are um, are, are singlet carbines. Let's just quickly get up um, HCs. So in terms of electron counting, you can, and, and, and sort of the overall bonding depiction, depiction, you can think of NHC metal complexes as like what the Crabtree textbook just describes them as fish, uh, Fisher carbines on steroids, because not only do they have one heteroatom donating group, they have two. Um, and, and in terms of um, bonding and reactivity, they, they, they interact with metals mostly like phosphines, um, except the, the one difference is that they're stronger sigma donors, they have stronger trans effect, but they're, they're weaker pi acceptors. They're, they don't engage in much pi back bonding. And so when you, as, as I alluded to, when you see a metal um, NHC complex, the NHC in, in catalysis is typically going to be held, held on the metal. And so as I said, these look like this. Um, you know, there are some stylistic differences in the literature. Some people draw, draw this way. Some people draw um, this way. Some people will draw this with a, a dashed line here. But they all essentially mean the, the same thing. The, the key point is if you see this, then you, you should know that it's an NHC. Sometimes this type of carbine is referred to as an Arduango carbine or a uh, Wands Lake carbine. So the contribution of, of uh, these two folks is, is finding that carbines uh, and heterocyclic carbines of this type can be can be stable in, in, uh, e even when not supported by a metal.
these are not one type also. And then one of the things that um, I, I like to emphasize, and, and I think if, if you're interested in this topic, I think the Crabtree textbook does a nice job of discussing this, is that carbene, uh, metal carbenes really lie on a, on a continuum. It's not, it, it's not the case that, um, that this bonding to picture is 100% accurate 100% of the time and this bonding depiction is 100% accurate under the time, 100 of the time. It's really that as you vary the metal, the ligand environment, the substituents on the carbene, you access different electronic configurations. Um, and these are two extreme depictions that are useful as formalisms. But many of the most interesting types of complexes are somewhere in the middle. And so in these cases where you have amb ambiguous situations, um, then, you know, Probably first, we wouldn't ask you that on the test because that would be confusing. But if we did, you can just talk about how you would describe it, thinking about the carbene in either of the two ways, and acknowledge in your mind that the reactivity is going to be a blend of the two to two, um, 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 two, two, two general uh, sets of characteristics. And so I'll just give you a, a, a few examples, and I hope, I hope I won't confuse you, but um, just, just to emphasize this point. Um, so some of, many of the not clear-cut cases, I think, involve um, sort of, uh, you know, um, Cases you'd expect in metals that are, are sort of middle middle transition metals um, with with um, intermediate types of of, of, of of ligand sets, and so here are some examples. I think you see this often with ruthenium and osmium. Um, So halides, um, as substituents on the carbene, kind of have this intermediate um, effect of being um, both pi donating, but also um, overall being electrostatically electron withdrawing groups. So, so here are two cases where if you, for example, if you got this on a test, you could just, you could just write out um, how you would do electron counting in, in both situations. Um, and probably in the absence of, of more information, um, detailed um, spectral data, et cetera, you'd have a hard time necessarily pinpointing whether it's going to be one way or the other. 
Okay, so let's talk about the synthesis and reactivity of Fischer and Trock type carbenes, and then we can use that as a springboard to uh, jump into problem of the day number one. Encountered this complex several times already in this class, um, tungsten hexacarbonyl, and it was found that if you treat this with um, methyl lithium, you get nucleophilic attack on one of the uh, carbonyl groups. Transfer reagent, you can cap carbonyl. And this example was done by our chemist of the day today, which probably is an obvious one. Anyone want to cut it out? So, so this specific example was done in 1964, and this is the same fissure that we encountered when we introduced uh, ferrocene. had a real passion for unusual, um, at least unusual at the time, um, bonding interactions between organic groups and metals. The German who did most of his um, independent work in TU Munich. Known for um, carbenes and carbines. And, um, sandwich complexes. Most notably, ferrocene. And the structural proposal of uh, a ferrocene won him the Nobel Prize. And, Okay, so the Fisher lab found that um, this two-step sequence of reaction with a strong nucleophile and capping with a strong electrophile got that to some um, uh, organometallic complexes that hadn't been described before. Um, and the, the, the reactivity here is, um, is analogous with, um, with, with other... Um, types of nucleophiles, so let's just consider as a second example uh, chromium hexacarbonyl treated with LDA following the same sequence as above that can get us to Um, if 
if you're interested in this kind of information, but if you look at the X-ray crystal structure, the bond distance here is 2.13 angstroms, and in comparison, a, a typical chromium alkyl single bond is about 2.0 Shows, um, and this will be, I think, more informative when um, we, we look at the same um, metrics for shock type carbene. And so, in terms of the MO depiction. Right high here, I think it should still be okay. Um, often you see Fischer carbene complexes um, with CO ligands. carbines, you kind of have this push-pull um, effect. Between all of these different pi uh, donating and withdrawing groups, Unfilled Q orbital. We have the lone pairs here donating the unfilled Q orbital. And, and then these same Q orbitals that are engaged in back bonding here can be back engaged in back bonding to the CO ligands. And, and so, um, yeah, the overall um, electronic configuration is one in which you have many. Um, uh, many contributors um, and, and quite a bit of overall resonance stabilization. Okay, let's um, now talk about the reactivity of Fischer carbene complexes. And to do that, let's consider problem of the day number one, which shows this archetypal Fischer carbene shown here. And, and shows two representative types of reactions. So in one case, we're reacting with a hard Lewis acid, aluminum trichloride, and the other case, photo irradiating the complex. You get two different products. So take a minute to think about that, compare notes with your neighbor.
to Z G. What do you think for A? acid is going to um, demethylate. Okay, so how do you propose it will demethylate? What sequence of events, what mechanism? So the oxygen coordinated with the the nitrogen and the then presumably you're going to liberate a chloride anion, come back around here. Okay. Does anybody else have any other ideas for this? It's reasonable. Any other thoughts? It seems like you could go back to the original complex. Okay, yeah, that would be the end product of this sequence, right? Okay, can anything else happen upon coordination here? One, one insertion, okay. Um, so in this case... Is this what you're thinking about? And, and this maybe be found by holding them. Can you have the methyl group migrating to the toxin? Methyl migration? Okay, so this is I think similar to what Tanner proposed, but it would be a one it would be a one um, essentially alpha elimination. Um, but to transfer the methyl and then have the alkoxy on the uh, alkylidine, uh, uh, alkylidine, sorry. Okay, these are all reasonable ideas. I think Tanner is on, on the right track here. Um, so upon, um, so I think everybody has the initial idea right that Lewis acid is going to coordinate uh, to the um, non-bonding electrons on oxygen. But, and then from this complex, you can just push arrows um, to, um, to actually um, form what is essentially this, but um, now um, with that methoxy group, because it forms such a strong interaction with aluminum, um, is actually totally outer sphere, and, and the product is in fact a um, carbine type complex. Oh, sorry about that. charge on it, charge balance. Okay, and then from here, how would you get back to the starting material? 
sodium methoxide. Yeah, basically just some um, methoxide minus source methyl methoxide. Good. Okay. What about part product B from there? How about Schwann? <coughs> so what, what's typically the first thing that's going to happen to a carbonyl complex when you shine light on it? Okay. Um, what else can happen besides excitation? Loss of carbonyl. Okay. Lose carbonyl. You lose carbonyl. So now you have a coordinatively unsaturated, more reactive intermediate. No, it might not be obvious what happens, but do you have any ideas? Okay. I think now we're, we're kind of. Does anyone else want to suggest anything? Okay. Form of psychopropanone, I guess, with the toxin and the liberated CL? Psychopropanone, okay. Uh, so you want to do some bridging interaction? Yeah. I think this is maybe not obvious unless you've seen this specific example before, but what actually happens is it's actually it's similar to what you proposed for Tanner, is that you just get a migration of this group. thing here in terms of general reactivity principles is that after photo dissociation, you, 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 you have in the back of your mind that now but that the metal is coordinated and saturated, it wants to find another um, a, another group to coordinate to. And in this case, um, the way to do that is through uh, migration. Okay, good. So those are two examples of, um, of um, representative reactions. And let's consider some others. So um, if, yeah, this analogy of, of Fischer carbines to esters, I think, is very powerful and, and allows you to predict, anticipate a lot of what you, you end up seeing. So if you treat a Fischer carbine with uh, a, a amine, then you can get just like with Ester exchange to an amide, you can get a similar type of reaction from one Fischer carbine to, to uh, oxygen substituted Fischer carbine to an oxygen substituted one, and also do the equivalent of, um, of transesterification. And this analogy is also true in the sense that um, the Fischer carbines. Alpha 
protons are quite acidic. And so you can also engage in classical carbonyl type chemistry by deprotonating the alpha proton and then reacting with electrophiles. And so just to give a little sense of that, um, the, the pKa's here. of the Fischer carbene. I don't know if anybody knows from their Evans PKA table, the typical ester. So, Let's just be conservative and say 22 to 25. And then an amide uh, analog. Okay, so then now let's see um, an example of this in action. And I'll just ask you to help me predict the product. So let's consider this chromium, sure carbene complex. React with LDA. And based on this information, everybody would tell me that going to coordinate the alpha position. And so if we just react with our generic electrophile, then we can um, of course quench this. Just like a Alpha alkylation, an example. Here's maybe a slightly more interesting case. So, anyone want to take a stab? What happens if we treat this with an epoxide? We can shout it out as I draw it if anybody. What was that, Saul? Uh, 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 <laughs> <laughs> yes. okay. okay. So let's just walk us through what's going to happen. Yeah, so you open um, the epoxide and the epoxide and back into the, uh, like the darkness of the Okay. Okay, Max. So this is first uh, alpha alkylation uh, using epoxide as the electrophile. And then we're doing essentially the trans esterification um, that we talked about earlier. And the product is this. Uh, Max described it as a THF. Um, call it like a um, chromium THF alkylidine or something like that. And then if we react this further, DMBO or let's say can, then we can get out a lactone from it. Suppose. So there's a lot of really cool reactivity with Fischer carbene um, complexes. I think one of the um, overall limitations in this area has been that there aren't many processes that take advantage of 
the unique Fischer carbene reactivity and, and our, our catalytic in the metal um, of, of interest. And, and, and there are more so in the, in the Schrock, Schrock type case. Um, let's, uh, let's see if I can maybe fill out this last little bit here. Um, and so another type of reaction. Um, so let's consider generic Fischer carbene here. And so if we react this with a alkene uh, containing some electron withdrawing group in conjugation, what might we expect to happen based on the polarity? Anyone want to shout it out? I'll give you a hint. I have it drawn in a suggestive way. So if we just draw the partial charges, you know, the metal is partial negative, carbene is partial positive. So, um, yeah, we can draw a, yeah, I guess I've drawn it suggestively in a not helpful way. <laughs> this is happening first. And then from here you can get reductive elimination. Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, essentially, that's going to be a readout of whether this is concerted or stepwise. And I don't have it drawn in my notes, so I would be I would be guessing. Um, and, and my guess would be that it would be under um, and this process would probably be in equilibrium, so it would be under thermodynamic control. But I, that, that's an admitted guess. I don't know if anybody wants to comment further on that. Okay, so as I clear the board here, let's consider um, problem of the day number two. As I mentioned, um, carbenoids electronically, um, or, or in terms of the formalism, these are treated like Fischer carbenes. The reactivity is a little bit different, more like free carbene. And so to kind of illustrate the general reactivity principles at play, we're going to consider this specific case. There's quite a bit going on. Um, I won't, the, the, the prompt is a little bit long, so I'll just summarize it. Um, it's well known that these iridium, uh, uh, rhodium, bisrhodium uh, tetracarboxylate complexes engage in cyclopropanation. Um, it's believed that only one of the two metal sites is involved in those, uh, directly involved in those reactions, and so people have started looking at model systems where one of the metals is replaced, and, and one system that's been looked at are these bismuth-2 
systems. And so this is an example from the Firstner laboratory. And they find that the bismuth containing analog is much more reactive with certain types of classically unreactive alkenes like trichloroethylene. So there's a lot to process here. So let's take a minute to think about this. Why is that the case? Let's ra try to rationalize this observation. And then we'll discuss it as a group. Of course, just please discuss with your neighbor in the meantime. Okay, let's start discussing this one as a group. Max, what are your thoughts? So, at first I thought it was very similar, like, kind of evoking like a similar argument that you made with the metal arcanal interaction, uh, stabilizing a, um, like a, a metal carbene complex, but in the opposite sense. So, um, at first I thought the business was acting more acid point or trying to stay away from any rhodium carbon interaction you have and therefore they can work for being like more reactive. Okay. So in case anybody didn't hear that, let me just try to summarize. So so Max is saying that 
um, the, the bismuth is essentially serving as a, um, let, let's call it like a non-redox active Lewis acid and pulling electron density away from the reactive rhodium, making it more electrophilic and, in, and, and hence making the carbene more like the free carbene. And it is known, I think the, they, they note in the paper that free carbenes can do these types of insertions. So that would be consistent with that, with your proposal. I think they do make the TFA complex. And do they observe the same kind of trend? The, sorry, the bisrhodium TFA complex or the yeah. bismuth? I think the rhodium, I think no bisrhodium complex does this type of reaction, is my understanding. So, more like free copies, meaning that it's more electrophilic? More electrophilic, yes. And so one of the ways that I like to think about, and this could be wrong, but I think it's a useful heuristic nonetheless, is I think of metal, metal interactions and catalysis as the second metal is being like the electron reservoir. It can accept electron density when the transition state requires it and donate it when the transition state requires it. And so in this case, you're switching from a, this rhodium system where the second rhodium is better, has better orbital overlap and can engage in what's been described as a three-center, two-electron bond, two rhodiums, one carbene, sharing two electrons. Whereas when you switch to bismuth, because the 6p uh, orbital of, of bismuth 2 is not well matched with the 4d of rhodium, it cannot engage in this three center two electron bond. So it's essentially, it's just what Max said. It's serving as a Lewis acid, making the carbene more electrophilic. If it's uh, like bismuth 5 and bismuth 4. Is that, sorry, what was your question? Would that be the same? What's the alternation state to bismuth? This is a bismuth 2. Bismuth 2? Yeah. Oh. I think that's stated in the second line. Oh, so if anybody's interested, so it's a really beautiful full full paper. Um, if anyone wants to read more, you can see the, one of the nice things about this paper is uh, I think it's 2018. Is that right? Tyler, what was it? It's 2018 yet. Uh, They have all of the um, frontier orbital um, analysis and everything, so it's a really uh, informative read. That's right. And, and so, yeah, as, as I think one of the themes that I want to come out of this discussion is we won't talk about carbonoid transfer chemistry in much detail just in the interest of time, but um, again, it's going to be similar to what you see in, in, in free carbene chemistry. Typically, catalyst design in these systems ha has to do with making more and more complex metal complexes that are going to be controlling reactivity through sterics. This is a, 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 an example, one of the rare examples where people are really trying to uh, tune reactivity through the electronic um, um, catalyst, design, uh, uh, catalyst design to perturb electronics. Um, and and um, let's maybe, I'll, I'll, we'll do a bonus if um, anyone wants to take a stab at the doing the electron count on rhodium in this case.
Okay. What do you think, Tucker? Give us the general, your general thinking here. So, rhodium to. Okay. Tucker's ready for the midterm. Um, that's D7. Yes. Okay. Make sure I put the question. Okay, D7. are always complicated, so let's do those at the end. Yeah, so five regular ish pairs of five <laughs> regular ish. And, and then the metal metal bond is gonna be a one single electron from this. And then uh, you have the numbers up there. Okay, so this that the And one of the key things I wanted to point out is that for this, um, for these um, carbonoids, we should be thinking of these as L-type, L-type ligands. So, do we always count the carbon as two electrons? Well, if it's Fisher, a if it's Fisher, it's always two. If it's a Fisher, it is always two and electrons. If it's strong. Four electrons. It's X, X2, right? It's like in the Schrock case, just think of it as having two alkyl ligands, essentially. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. I think that, um, and, and that. The, the true oxidation state of the metal is likely going to, to change throughout the catalytic cycle, right? right. So the, the ground state and the, the, the carbene state will have, in, in, in reality, kind of different oxidation states. So, so remember that oxidation state is a formalism. And so based on this analysis, we, we assign this as rhodium-2. Um, in the absence of additional information, that's fine. If you had some reason to believe um, that spectroscopically this was looking like rhodium-3, then, then, then yes, it would stand to reason that this was one. So, so you can do further characterization. Basically, anything beyond this analysis would require experimental evidence. Mind what I'm saying carefully. Coming to, to so the questions coming from a carbene, metallic carbenoid uh, expert, um, but I think typically people think of these the cyclopropanations. I, you know, I think the most straightforward way to think about it, cyclopropanation and the CH abstraction, is as three sun or two electron transition states. That she's not happy with that <laughs> explanation. Well, so the question was if, if there is no vacant orbit to accept uh, the electrons, then. Uh, yeah, is that the uh, question? Yes, yeah, so how could it accept if it was uh, going to the four member would have to accept somehow electron density? 
if it's a four member. So I think you can draw it as a three membered where the, the, the metal is essentially a, like a, 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 a substituent off of the carbine, right? Oh, like a three membered, yes. Let's move forward here we, in the interest of time. To a brief discussion of troctet carbenes and their synthesis and reactivity. So, um, last class we actually um, discussed in, in more detail the synthesis of the first troctet carbene that was in 1973 um, at, at DuPont. And so I think, again, this gives you a little bit of a sense for how young this area of study really is. And, and when this, um, this is a nice, it's supposed to be a nice orange, orange solid. Um, and, and this caused quite a, a, a stir in the organometallic community because nobody had seen basically every example of a metal carbon double bond that had been described in the literature was of the Fisher type. But there was no... Uh, Truck type, Fisher type, was just carbene, and every the whole universe of known carbenes were these um, heteroatom substituted carbenes, and so um, when Schrock reported this example of an alkylidine, which violated everything that people knew about carbenes, it really uh, caught, captured a lot of attention, um, and, and and one of the things that um, stands out if you look at the, um, the, the, the structural data of this, this um, close relative um, of, of the original shock type carbene. You notice that the CC, um, uh, the, the uh, metal carbene bond is quite a bit um, shorter. And so as I described at the beginning of class, these bonds are, are, are viewed as, as being stronger in, in, in nature. Okay, so let's cover some general reactivity. And so in this case, the, the shock type carbenes are um, nucleophilic at carbon. And so we saw an example of this reaction with the same conditions in the problem of the day. But now we're going to get a very different outcome. Does anyone want to have the same condition, similar? Anyone want to predict what's going to happen here? Shout it out. Hmm? Yeah, so let's just talk about what's going to happen first. Um, was suggesting that this might come back around and form some kind of bridging um, complex. That, that could be the case. I don't have that in my notes, but that might, might be the case. And then um, another kind of classical type of reaction that differs dramatically. Fisher, what happens if we react this with carbonyl? Step. The carbene will attack the electrophilic carbon atom. To form this um, 
oxometallocyclobutane. And then in these kinds of reactions, particularly with early transition metals, basically any time you have a trans uh, Schrock type uh, carbene with an early transition metal um, and, and you react it with something containing a carbonyl compound, the thermodynamic sink is always going to be formation of the metal oxo. Um, and metal oxos, as we'll cover very briefly um, in a minute or two, especially with early transition metals, are often these oligomeric, oligomeric uh, polymeric materials, so they're extremely stable and they often precipitate out of solution. And so that's the driving force here. And we'll get out the alkylidine transfer product as well as some tantalum oxo polymer. So one of the um, reactivity patterns that will become important when we discuss uh, ultimatopsis, primer, reactions of uh, truck type carbines. Alkenes, so the key idea here is that these react to form metallocyclobutanes. So depending on the, you see I've drawn this as just generic, generic carbine here. Depending on the metal, the ligand environment, the oxidation state, et cetera, you can get different outcomes here. So one would be the um, alkylity transfer product, as we'll see in olefin you can also, as we saw in, in this case, get direct CC reductive elimination. And then we had an example similar to this with, with nickel, where you can also get, um, in the five, we saw an example with the five member case, you can also get beta hydride elimination. So in the remaining time, I'm just going to introduce you to general properties of other um, metal carbon and metal heteroatom multiple bonded species. sure to cover is, is the electron counting. Um, that's um, important are amidos. This can come in two flavors, um, linear or bent.
and the geometry here allows you to read out something about the bonding interaction. So um, if we just think an analogy to a shock type carbene, then, 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 then yeah, this would be, you expect this to be X2, but because this actually has lone pairs here that can participate in bonding, um, you, you can get a more complicated um, X2L situation where this is, is a linear um, mode. And, and there's some subtlety here because some, some, sometimes um, a complex, you can get like a solid state structure of a complex and it will look bent. But in reality, it's still um, serving as a six electron donor. It just happened to you know, crystallize in that conformation or, 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 or something like that. So you have to be a little bit careful. I think in general, if you just see it in the MIDO and it's not specified um, how, how to think about it, you should think of it as a six electron um, donor. And then there's also um, a little nitrido. Are, um, similar. These are drawn almost always with the full uh, triple bond, but it's sort of a similar bonding um, um, situation here in trans three. Um, and then let's consider oxo. the exact same situation um, where these, depending on how you're thinking about the non-bonding electrons, these can be either um, X2 or LX2, and if you're not given any information, additional information, um, you, you should think of them as LX2, six electron, um, it's common for D0. And so sometimes in the literature you'll actually see these, these drawn as triple bonded uh, complexes to really emphasize this. And, and, and again, you can take a deep dive and, and study the electronic configuration of the metal and the bond distance, etc. if you really want to disambiguate. Um, but again, this starts to come down to the point where the formalisms are not always as descriptive as you might you might hope. And then we saw one example of this, but there are also um, metal carbon triple bonded carbine complex. And these, following essentially the same principles as we already discussed, can be either Fisher or shock type. Think of this like in the Schrock type case, it's now basically you just have three, you know, it's equivalent to having metal bond to three alkyl groups. In the Fisher case, it's like having a Fisher and an and, 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 and alkyl group hanging, hanging around. And then one of the points that came up at the end of the um, um, that, uh, uh, th this example is, is that many um, metal oxo species, particularly uh, group four, um, are, are, are highly bridged and in extreme cases can be oligomeric or, or even solid state materials like titanium oxide being, I think, the, the sort of uh, you know, archetypal example there. Okay, so let's wrap up by considering quickly, um, and this should be, a, I think, a quick question, problem of the day number three. And so this asks us to consider 
the part A at least, the silicon analog to carbenes, which are called silylenes. Let's first just draw out this qualitative orbital diagram. Okay, what do you think, Zuchi? Help me fill, fill things in here. Anybody have the? Well, there's only one other opinion. I guess you could ask. Does anyone want to advocate for the other depiction? I could. Okay. Um, I think um, there's just it, you're paying a higher energy price by having the electrons unpaired when instead they could be in a much lower um, signal orbital instead of in the uh, pure orbital. And then you have the high back bonding available to uh, further stabilize the complex. Okay, so your argument was that the, let me see if I understand this correctly, um, to have this um, basically you're, you're saying that the pairing energy um, sort of violate Hung's rule is, is, is not the same, uh, and, uh, is, is smaller than the energy that it, that, that it would take to, uh, to have the, this unfilled, is that right? Yeah. Okay. Any other discussion? So possibly, yeah, the orbitals are more diffused for silicon, and also there are... And what, what would that, how would that factor in? Sorry. How would that factor in? So there are more diffuse, so that means the exchange energy is going to be, so the penalty for there is going to be outweighed by exchange energy, so it's basically lower. And the energy gap is, uh, uh, yeah, so it's more favorable for electrons to be paired to exchange energies for the lower. Yeah, so in practice, I think this is a good, good discussion, in practice, these are singlet character, and so they're, they're fissure type, if you want to think of it like that, and they're very strong, very strong to the donors, and very high acceptors. And in fact, they're, they're such weak uh, pi acceptors from the metal that they're most commonly isolated with a Lewis, as Lewis base adducts. And, and I think only in the past. Wait, sorry, why are they weak pi acceptors? So there's not much metal that much. Yeah, I think that this has to do, um, this is a, a little bit beyond my area, but I think it has to do with the fact that the, that the um, um, 
orbitals on the, the, the p orbital on silicon that you're donating into is just not uh, not well aligned, uh, and they're not good orbital mixing with the uh, filled uh, d orbitals on on the metal. It's hard to say. Yeah, I think Tyler's point here is that it's hard to say in some sense because the most characterized examples have heteroatoms here, and so it's hard to know what the situation is with without heteroatoms there. Is that your point? Yeah, and like NHCs are not great um, by acceptors. So going down that route, though, did they become better by acceptors? I think that. So that, that gets to part B, essentially. Oh, yeah. Okay. No. okay, good. Yeah, so I think that the trend is the opposite, actually. They become even stronger sigma donors and weaker Why? by acceptors. likely depend on, on on several factors, but I think empirically that's the observed trend. Um, yeah, one of the big, another big factor that's true for A and B is that, remember, compared to carbenes, nitrine, or carbenes, amidos, oxos, that all of the elements that are involved here are much less electronegative. And so, um, in addition to this orbital overlap um, argument, that there's sort of less of a general um, driving force for back donation because that the atom involved is not as electronegative. And that, that holds true, right? That kind of explains the trend as you go down the series. Okay, we're dismissed. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have after class.